So welcome everybody. Um, really delighted to have Karen with us, who's calling us from London, although she is still in residence at the Promise Institute, but like everybody else now from afar. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to have Karen here to share with us some of the work that she's been um, producing while she's been in her residency. And um, Karen, I think I'll just hand over to you straight away to introduce us to what we're going to be listening to today. Um, thanks, Kate. Um, can everybody, well, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, fantastic. Um, I'm going to read some work in progress um, and we're going to sort of read it in two parts. Um, one of which um, is a poem um, it's in a form, it's a particular form, it's called a glossa. Um, and a glossa is a, it's, it's an old, it's a very old um, poet, poetic form, um, sort of way back in the Renaissance times. Um, and you take a little section, um, four line verse actually, um, from a poet who you may want the work to connect to. Um, and then you expand on it. Um, so that's the prelude to the piece um, and then I'm going to read from what I would call um, a lyric essay um, it's it's a it's a form that echoes and borrows from a Japanese form called as Wihitsu which is a kind of series of interlinked narratives um, and the subject um, of the essay um, it's, it's currently titled Systems of Erasure um, and it connects to a larger project um, that I have been researching and engaged in um, whilst being in residence at the Promise Institute um, and um, also as a um, Fulbright postdoctoral scholar at UCLA. Um, it's um, what I was looking at was our relationship with space and with movement and enclosure. Um, and so obviously as um, time has gone on and you find me here, here in London um, working virtually, as we all know, the, um, our relationship with um, space and restriction has um, changed quite dramatically um, since, since I was last in Los Angeles. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read the um, prelude to the poem um, and I'm now going to attempt to do something um, quite extravagant, which is to share the screen um, so that you can read part of it whilst I read it. So this is the prelude and as I said, it takes four lines. Um, from a longer piece, The Village Minstrel, on enclosure by the 19th century British Romantic poet, John Clare. O oh, England, boasted land of liberty, with strangers still thou mayst they, thy title own, but thy poor slaves the alteration see, with many a loss, to them the truth is known. O oh, England, boasted land of liberty, of palms drummed strong on pink and gristled chests, of lawns landscaped to rust, liverish as dogs piss in summer's drought, windswept and observed on closed and uptight circuits, where one good eyes enough. How erotic, always to be watched while we slept through hurricanes and other chaotic procedures. Our demise, a triptych on the walls of multi-storey, glassy cathedrals. The centre panel, a tissue of idyllic hills and hens, clucking a corporate pastoral. Epic as it was, causal. On every treetop, a crow, crowned a survivor, guzzling from oily puddles while worthless kings allowed nothing and 
everything, so kleptocracy flowered, bloody as exploded capillaries, exponential detonations designed to devour all forms of flesh and resistance, bodily or otherwise. Oh, walled world of disparity and hard surfaces, of barbed fences augmented by engineered despair and steel cages, where algorithmic swords pierce skin, gluttonous for the gruel of hard knocks. Behold the petal, silky and violet. Only bees ignore the buzz of armed response, systems to keep each Eden inviolate. Every lavender bush and cactus flower is private. Do not pick the fruit. A pilfered blackberry is a sin that stains this age of ordered disquiet. In America, oh, boasted land of liberty. Oh, boasted land of liberty, America, of winged flamingo skies and thrusting palms, of sweat-rich fields and manufactured terror, deadly as Academy-awarded napalm. Don't forget the TMs. For nouns and verbs can be bought and loaned. And although the enemy is history, remembered, with strangers still thou may thy title own. You claim these stolen lands, call elders crone and daughters bitches, as if the one who calls you friend deserves no more than scorn. Who doesn't need a bone to chew on? We are by love and hunger trained. God knows why else a dog still loves a fiend. Blood rules the pack that blindly follows, nose to the coiled and entrailed end but thy poor slaves, the alteration, see. And now a new enclosure surrounds our cities. Rents are sky high and inhospitable Mars is considered viable property for those who want more than electric cars can offer. Tents deemed to have marred the view are removed residents gunned down when they protest against barbed wire. With many a loss to them, the truth is known. So um, that's the um, first and um, opening section um, to the piece. Um, Kate, there you are, you're back. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. I feel like I've just been punched in the sternum, actually. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> uh, in a good way. In a good way. Yeah. Yeah, like, good. good. <laughs> um, Powerful. I'd, I mean, there's, there's so much in there. So what we thought we would do is that I will uh, ask Karen, you know, a couple of questions to, um, you know, provoke her to talk a little bit about the poems but if you would also like to ask her something please do um put your hand up and uh you can also join the conversation so uh, and then we'll go back to karen reading the lyric essay and then we can discuss that again after that okay. so well i mean maybe karen it would be nice to hear a little bit about why you chose the john clare piece and what what yeah. the poem is about what those themes are yeah. um well i've kind of I started actually looking at John Clare's work because um, I was interested in his journals and his nature journals and um, I kind of love the tone of journal writing and um, the next piece I'll read you'll, you'll hear a little bit more um, of that. Um, but I think that thematically um, my, my great interest in Clare um, as a romantic poet is that he's a He's a poet that doesn't really kind of sort of fit the romantic stereotype in a way. Um, you know, he was known as the peasant poet um, and he was poor, he was working class. Um, he managed to learn to read 
um, even though that wasn't, you know, he didn't really come from a background where that was easily, um, you know, easily the case for him. And he, he did go to school in the village. Um, but I think also because he, um, I think because very much because Claire was a poet of protest. Um, he was a working class poet of protest. Um, he was a poet who loved to walk um, and walk in the countryside. Um, and he had to work in the countryside as well. Um, so his relationship with it was, was kind of twofold. It was, you know, poetically, it was one of awe and wonder, um, but it was also sort of one of labor. Um, but in both cases, it was one of quite intense proximity. Um, and Claire, um, Claire, Claire was writing at a time when the um, sort of British countryside, so a lot of the common land um, in the um, British, you know, in Britain, in the UK and in England, um, a lot of that was being fenced off. So at that time, um, at that time, kind of people who, who didn't have land of their own could graze their sheep and they could take their sheep um, or their, um, you know, kind of, you know, other sort of animal livestock and they could graze that on, on what was known as common land. Um, and um, through various acts of enclosure, um, that um, access to the common land was um, progressively prohibited. Um, and in fact, in, in the UK, when you, when you see somewhere that might, you know, we have places like Wimbledon Common, Clapham Common around London, you know, there's lots of commons and heaths. But the commons, um, they're actually remnants of much larger swathes of land. So, you know, so the sort of, um, the landed gentry would kind of like leave a sort of very small portion of what was once a much larger area um, that everybody could use. Um, and, and for Claire, um, you know, it completely, um, it completely changed his, his life and relationship with the countryside. And he, um, he protested um, absolutely vigorously um, against um, the enclosures that he was experiencing. Um, so that's really why, you know, kind of Claire spoke to me you know, kind of really, really so loudly um, in that sense. So I know you've, I mean, the, the parallels with, uh, of course, what's happened, what happened in America are, are, are really interesting in terms of enclosures. And you mentioned barbed wire in that mm. poem. And I know that that's one of the themes, it's almost a central theme that mm. you've been looking at. And you showed many photographs of barbed wire. Can you explain the significance of barbed wire or what you're exploring around barbed wire? Mm. Um, yeah, well, um, I kind of felt that it was a very, you know, kind of in a way barbed, barbed wire is very much um, a kind of a very iconic symbol um, of weaponized enclosure. Um, and so we think of it from the two world wars um, and I've been engaged in a, a project looking at um, the Caribbean experience in World War One, and I had started thinking about it then. Um, and in fact, um, you know, this this essay will expand um, what, what I'm about to read. You know, to sort of incorporate a lot more about um, Bob Wire's role as a sort of as a military weapon. Um, but as I started to look into um, Bob Wire, what I wasn't aware of was that um barbed wire had um its original um where it where it came you know its original invention was actually to um control cattle um and particularly in the american west um and as i started to look into it what i, I discovered was that it was um in many ways um 
not not the weapon of colonization but um perhaps the most profoundly impactful on a very widespread scale um of of both um the american um you know the united states of america and very specifically um the western states um and um at the, at the time of the civil war um so i i kind of became very interested in and in how it has both um a political um and a geographic deployment um and i use the word deployment uh, purposefully um because um the homestead act of 1862 um which um which which bob dwyer was very 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 much a part of um its implementation the homestead act gave um any american um uh immigrant um and citizen immigrant so sort of any um any kind of non-indigenous not not any non-indigenous american actually because in fact lincoln um you know implemented the act so as to it was kind of a, a an act of aggression um against the south in the civil war um it was an economic act of aggression um and a way of colonizing the west as i see it um but you know for the for the homesteaders it was this opportunity that they if they were thought to be farming or improving the the land um then they could take up to 164 acres under this act and claim it so it's very much um sort of instrumental um in that settlement because they began to fence off land um and they also fenced this land off because they they wanted to contain cattle in that space um which was very um detrimental to the economies of the indigenous communities um who um had a symbiotic um you know survival relationship with the buffalo who very much roamed um and cattle also were, were roaming freely at that point um so that's that's the sort of um interest that i you know developed in barbed wire but also just because it has become such a kind of symbolic um material object um in terms of enclosure and in terms of um prohibiting um movement through an object that is inherently violent yeah well that, that enclosures again interestingly happening at similar times right the enclosures in england and the settling kind of yeah absolutely um yeah yeah i mean definitely the sort of mid 19th century sort of more more broadly um and actually you know i mean the enclosures in the uk have been sort of occurring um for, for some time but um you know they were sort of culminating um culminating at that period so i kind of got i got very interested in um you know this 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 kind of process of the the land grab and how um you know it was it was occurring you know not just through um you know the traditional um you know kind of methods of of, of warfare um but but through this seemingly sort of static um static object static material um yeah no fast i mean i love the parallels but there's the uk us kind of parallel but then there's also of course the then and now parallel and then you take the barbed wire from and I think you'll be talking about that uh, more in the essay as well. But I mean, to like past barbed wire to what I think you called in the poem, the algorithmic swords. So like the invisible yeah. continuing displacement. But maybe uh, maybe you can read the read the essay for us now. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll give that a read. It's got it's got some images as well. Um, and um, <clears throat> oh, papers are over here. Just have to find where they are um 
some of them I'll read from papers, but you'll see something on the screen. Um, Are you still sharing your screen? Uh, can you still see this? this no. Can you see the interlude? Oh, someone can. Yes. Julia can. Oh, Julia, you can see that. Jess, you can't? I can't. I can um, now. Can now. You okay. can. Okay, that's good. Oh, yeah, I see it. Um, okay, great. Um, okay, I'm just going to leave you like that. Um, yeah, so this is the, um, uh, just to sort of say very, very briefly to introduce it, it's, um, it's an essay that combines, um, it's a sort of photo essay, um, sort of stroke poem, uh, stroke sort of essay, sort of uh, meander. It has some meandering elements um, and it's very much in progress. Um, and I'm just going to read an excerpt from it. It will be uh, a sort of much, much longer, will probably be a longer piece. I suppose I was thinking about it really it's a bit like a sort of piece of woven cloth and at the moment it's a little bit like a sort of crocheted jacket and uh, might become a piece of fine linen eventually but it's still in the sort of crochet stage <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll read that for you um, bear with me one moment Uh, there was a sign that said in interlude, so all is well. I will, I will begin again. Right. The neighbours will need to access the new terrace. This I write to a friend who's drawing some sketches so I can define ownership of the space in the communal garden. They have a legal right to Pass. For a long time I found it difficult to process the aesthetic ambivalence of tattoos, as in some tattoos look shit. This made me think more about tattoos and I became convinced they were a response to a larger land grab orchestrated by a global kleptocracy. As I write this, a little robin lands on the arm of the wooden bench with its peeling paint under the bamboo wind chime, little territorial robin. And as if by magic, I hear the creak of unoiled metal at the garden gate. Recognisable voices waft over the bluebells and alkanet. At a time when gentrification was intensifying around the world, at a time when state violence against black, brown and working class people continues to intensify. I think, I started to think tattoos were a generational and territorial act. I started to think a tattoo was a way in which to reclaim agency over the body as our access to and freedoms within public space diminished. I'm not talking about the sacred art of tribal tattoos that document family trees, bloodlines and ecologies of belonging, although most tattoos do denote belonging to a team, a gang, a community of like-minded folk. That and a relationship with pain, a pricking of the skin, a breach of the epidermis, the needle injecting ink into the dermis, a commitment to permanence. It is painful, this exile from the garden, self-imposed and also provoked. I'm burning sage at the edges, sage from the plains, the plains I remember in a waking dream, plains I've driven through, plains where the land is closer to the sky, where the sky is imminent. I'm also considering runes. A tattoo is a musical term from the Dutch. Tap toe, literally meaning to close the tap on the cask. It is a military term, a bugle sounds and soldiers gather. It's also defined as any drumming or tapping.
Does the seep of ink into the dermis, the deeper layer under the surface, also represent another level of resistance, a way of counteracting state-sanctioned intrusion in terms of personal space? the point of contact where needle meets skin, this layer of separation where one becomes other is called an ecotone. It is the exact moment where two ecosystems meet, tonos coming from the Greek meaning tension. It is the moment where the surface of the body meets the air, meets the shore, meets the fence. Two meters. It's the length of a tallish man or an Alice. We decide on our walk to the brow of the hill where we stop at Otto's memorial bench. And I point out the acrostic. The bench is cordoned off again. Last year, it was a fence 10 foot tall, erected at the edges of a community festival that was free and open for many years. Now it's the virus. We must not sit on the bench, we must not sunbathe, we must not pause to catch breath. The UK's Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994 criminalised many activities that were formerly civil offences. Squashing, camping, gatherings in fields and in section 63 1b, music which included sounds wholly or predominantly characterised by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats. Abraham Lincoln passed the 1862 Homestead Act. Newspapers advertised great inducements and liberal offers to all who wished to secure for themselves a home. The first to make a claim was a man called Daniel Freeman, a freeman, a white man, in Beatrice, Nebraska. Freed slaves were allowed to claim these stolen lands too. This was a political maneuver to further destabilize the southern economy. It was an act of war. Daniel Freeman writes in a letter to a woman he addresses initially as friend Agnes. As soon as I go to where it can be taken, the Indians have been peaceable. Until lately, they've been killing some out west near where I was hunting and have drove off a large lot of horses and cattle. I shall start next Thursday with a company of volunteers and a war party of Pawnee and Otto Indian warriors to drive the hostile Indians from the settlements. Daniel Freeman was the first to take the free land. He was there to take the land as the clock struck midnight on January the 1st, 1863. Daniel Freeman liked to go and hunt buffalo with friends. He took land in Beatrice, Nebraska. That is where he took the land. He could not wait to take the land. On our road trip to Wyoming, to Colorado via South Dakota, I noticed the animals the cattle are all more tightly penned, squashed together like marshmallows in a packet. The deer still run free. We've been, in, we've been in Nebraska for two minutes when the police pull us over. The younger officer is the sheriff. He's nervous, terribly polite, introduces himself as Rhett. Not Rhett Butler, a younger country singer we've not heard of before, but he is Rhett Butler. It's like a gleaming multi-columned southern mansion, especially when he laughs nervously. Did I say that he was nervous? Did I say the older officer never takes his hand off his gun? Did I say Zoe is dark skinned? Can you imagine a whiter name, Rhett asks. It's a small town. We drive at the edge of the speed limit until we cross the state line. A willow fence is woven while the branches are alive, plaited like hair with its roots still sunk. A willow grows back vigorously when pruned hard. A tattoo is also a musical term. 
two meters, six feet, the length of a tallish man. Have you noticed how lockdown has hushed us, Lucy asks, as if we're all seated by a deathbed. Nobody turns the music up. The radio in the hallway reminds me that under lockdown, there's a surge in domestic violence. How the shuttered home is a closed eye, an averted eye, an eye downcast. Vulnerabilized women and children are trapped. How our bodies become dilated space. Dido, whose name means wanderer, fled Libya to escape her brother, a king and sculptor who fell in love with one of his statues, a mythological representation of a woman. She fled to escape a brother who killed her husband. On her travels in exile, moving in the opposite direction from fraternal violence, she meets the king of a local tribe who sells her a piece of land the size of bull's hide. But Dido doesn't like the size of the ox hide and she cuts the cow skin into thin strips and uses it to encircle a far larger area of land that becomes her own city, her own city, her own city that she calls Carthage. Until last month, bulky bundles over 60 cubic gallons could be confiscated from unhoused people living in encampments on the streets of Los Angeles. Now their bundles are protected, although they remain unsheltered. I meet Chella at a meeting with the Stop LAPD spying coalition that opposes the white gaze in a stalker state through algorithmic predictive policing tools that he used to confine Skid Row residents within an ever diminishing radius of existence. That is a long sentence, but describing the stealth of state sanctioned land grab and violence takes its time. The coalition had to subpoena the data to discover these geographic implications. Chella's tattoo pictures a camper van with an acronym, acronym Y-G-S-L-R-H-S-T-F-U-T, which stands for, you guys suck like real hard. Shut the fuck up. Thanks. And I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> on Chella, I think she says um, the perfect, um, perfect outro. <laughs> Sorry, I was talking to myself. Oh, okay, good. I was uh, worried that if I'd been reading for ages and no one had heard anything. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so we all heard it. So I'd really like to encourage people to um, ask Karen some questions or just reflect on what they've heard. Um, you know, it's it's pretty dense it's not as dense as the poem but it's still packed with ideas and i would love some people just to um yeah just to throw in comments and questions to karen unfortunately i seem to have lost the function where i can see whether anyone's got their hand up so i think just unmute yourself and speak hi karen i'm margo thank you so hey, so much i i can't wait to see that in print so that i can focus on the words more carefully but I just love the way you incorporated the theme of tattoos because as a mother of three daughters in their 20s, I've been a firsthand witness to that generation taking on something that is so foreign to me. And there's been this sense in my head of anarchy or protest or something that they are doing to demonstrate their disconnect from society and the rest and i've never heard anyone put it into words before and it's just Aww. it was just so fabulous to have you put those poetic words to what i've been witnessing and trying to understand mm, well, that's, that, that's fascinating yeah i mean actually a line that i had in the poem uh which i took out but i made put back in you know still in all can shift and change but one of the lines was i bet she doesn't have a tattoo <laughs> <laughs> which was kind of about myself because um, I was thinking about people 
you know, kind of like with tattoos or with a lot of tattoos that would maybe think that, you know. Um, but I did, I did find it very, very fascinating. And I kind of like, I think one of the themes that runs throughout the whole um, piece, Margot, is this sort of I, idea of that surface point. Um, and that, that, could, that could be a wire um, or, it, you know, perhaps it comes down to our, our skin itself. Um, you know, but where we have this, this, this space between these two different realms and, you know, what, what happens at that point? Um, and the idea that people are, are, are taking ownership of the, you know, the, the body in, the way, in that way, I, I find quite fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And I love when you first introduced it, I had this picture in my head of the woman who has to make public access through her terrace. I don't have the words in front of me, but I was, you know, I could so visualize that. And then you introduce this other concept and, and talk about tattoos. And it was just for me so visual of the two pieces of society that were witnessed to, you know, the, the haves and the have nots, as I see a lot of these young people who have decorated themselves with tattoo and seems to seem to be exhibiting, you know, this, this, these visual images of protest. It was, I, I loved that piece. That was so great. Oh, Thank great. Thank you. Um, I think as well, um, I was I was talking to a, a friend of mine um, who had had um, some of her tattoos done in um, New Zealand um, and thinking about, you know, how the tattoo, um, you know, kind of operates um, within an indigenous or tribal context. And um, I, I was talking to an artist, a, a New Zealand artist of, about her tattoos and they can be very, you know, it, it, it's very fascinating the way that they, um, you know, kind of tell and map a story of a, of a family um, and the family's relationship perhaps to a, to a village or a place. Um, and then it just sort of made me think about that sort of idea about, um, you know, belonging as well and how, um, you know, we, you know, even, even in the West and even sort of, you know, now and with, um, you know, a younger generation of people having tattoos, there is still this kind of sense of, um, of belonging in, within that as well as the idea of protest. Yeah. I had a question about your use of coronavirus in the poem, and I know you've been working on the poem for a long time, and so I was just wondering if you could talk about how the experience of the virus has shaped it. Um, and by the way, people are still sitting on park benches here, so that was a shocking image to me. I didn't know they were oh, sitting wow. down park yeah. benches. Well, actually, since I took that photograph, the bench, I'm, I'm quite near that park where I am, and the, the bench has now got a, um, a notice on it with a list of things that are not, not available. Uh, to, to do, um, you know, in, in the bench. No, but that, that uh, um, yeah, so there's, there is definitely no sitting on benches. Um, in terms of the time scale, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, it started a little while back and then has since um, kind of been updated to incorporate uh, the, the, the present situation. Um, and, um, you know, because I'm still writing it at the moment, so I'm sort of working on it now, and it's kind of in, I'm in the middle of that. So um, I, I'm quite interested in um, the idea of a two meter radius. And, um, you know, in a way, ironically, I think that we actually have, um, we've, we've, we've almost got, um more space in the city with our two meter radius around us which is qu is quite hard to um you know to maintain actually at some points you know because because people don't always uh take a take account of it but um yeah so um yeah so i'm sort of interested in this sort of idea of um you know what 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 happens what ha what happens to the imagination as well when um you know space becomes so much tighter um and also in a way one of the trajectories of the essay 
was um, and will be to trace um, barbed wire as a system of material enclosure, as a physical object. And then I became very interested in um, algorithmic enclosure. Um, and then from algorithmic enclosure, which is an invisible, you know, wire and, a, you know, an invisible weapon, we've now got a kind of um, microscopic um, form of um, enclosure, another invisible, um, you know, kind of, I suppose, enclosure system. Uh, I don't know if it's an enclosure system, but uh, the virus is certainly triggered that um, but it's but it's still something that we can't see so I'm sort of interested in in that journey as well from uh, what we can feel very very physically um, to you know sort of other 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 forms and I mean you know violence is always the ultimate uh, incentive if we can put it that way um, um, but yeah I uh, don't know if that, I mean, you know, the, 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 the changes, I mean, weirdly, actually, you know, in some ways I've been like, oh, well, you know, welcome to the life of a freelance, <laughs> welcome to the life of a poet. This is what we do. <laughs> We're just here on our own anyway, but we can socialize. And that's, um, <laughs> that's of course, a massive difference. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. Somebody trying to say something. I'm not sure. Um, there's chat yeah. zone as well, isn't there? Sorry, there's chat as well. Yeah, I can't see it for some reason it's vanished. Have you got some questions in there? Or? Hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, why you put Dido in there? I mean, I guess it was the story of the cowhide and the enclosing the space and how she played with it or I don't know just I thought that was interesting. She's actually, uh, she's a, I have written, I, I wrote something else around that character a long time ago but one of the things that always struck me when I was researching her and writing about, uh, it was actually a different Dido but I, I looked at the uh, you know the mythological character um, and um, I just got fascinated by the idea of this woman who, um, you know, has to, um, you know, flee flee her brother who who has killed her husband and um, is likely to kill her, um, you know, in a kind of territorial act of kingship, and then I just I just love this idea. I mean, I was interested in it on two levels actually. So this idea that she, you know, she buys a piece of land from a local tribesman and she says, okay, you know, she, it's gonna, and he says, okay, it's gonna be this size, the size of this cowhide. And she's like, yeah, but actually this cowhide could be any size and then cuts it up into tiny strips, you know, tiny strips and circles this whole city. And, you know, part of that made me sort of think like, oh, it's, you know, it's kind of very ingenious. And she's had to be ingenious to survive. Um, and it's this sort of idea that you could have a very small space and then you could turn it into something much larger. But then I also started to think about that in a colonial sense as well, you know, so that you've got, so, you know, and that, that's sort of part of the, you know, kind of um, the Western expansion um, and, a, you know, kind of American um, settler project. And this idea that you might start out with something, you know, quite sort of small, 164 acres. But then, you know, the next thing you know, 10% of all the land in America has been um, given um, by the government um, and taken. I think um, is a, you know, sort of more accurate terms. It's been sort of taken and um, redistributed um by by the government so there's this sort of idea that you could start with this uh quite quite sort of what would seem like quite a modest amount and then that that you know idea of it shape shifting and stretching so it was kind of both the idea of ingenuity um and also kind of um inconstancy that i found to be sort of quite fascinating there um 
But also, you know, for us now in enclosure, we have to be more ingenious with those those two meters. What happens in those two meters? You know, we've got to suddenly, <laughs> well, not not in the two meters of stay away, but in the kind of like confines of the home. Um, and it was interesting as well, um, just to go back slightly um, um, to Kathy's question. You know, this one of the things that I sort of been thinking about around the idea of safe space and when we draw that safe space it was this idea that you know when we're at home you know it was very much this idea with corona oh shelter in place and I did immediately um, uh, the, the, the prospect of what that might mean for uh, women and children um, uh, living in situations of domestic violence um, that you know kind of I I did have a concern in that area and then unfortunately um, certainly that's been the case here in the UK that calls to domestic violence um, helplines um, I think have almost doubled um, so there's been a huge spike um, in that um, in terms of you know that that that's been one of the you know there's been um yeah there there has been an increase um and an increase in, in people reaching out mm. in that place. i think it's a really fascinating i mean coincidence that you were working on this project about space and confinement and safe and unsafe and then you know the pandemic hit and you've got this whole nother layer of examining it it's really extraordinary but um, maybe you could tell us a bit about what you um, about what the project looks like from now on, and what you imagine the final kind of piece to be. Because uh, yeah. I should tell everybody listening that um, Karen will be coming back to UCLA after the summer when we're hopefully all there in person, um, and yeah. will be performing the results of the work which she obviously wasn't able to do this academic year. So, what what? can we expect what are you what do you how do you think it's going to evolve from here um well i think that um as i said there'll be um i think there's going to be a few more strands and a few more sort of details uh you know within within those strands that will sort of take place things that i want to talk about so there's a big long section on um uh english gypsies um john clare wrote a lot about gypsies um but this sort of idea of um cultures who uh, that are nomadic so that sort of idea of um human movement um will probably sort of come into that more and i'll talk quite a little bit more about um the sort of development and deployment of barbed wire um at the moment you can just sort of see it in the essay as a visual presence so um you know it was funny because i was in la and i was i was you know sort of really looking to see it and you, you can't really see it anywhere and it wasn't until i went downtown that i actually you know she sort of found these sort of great coils of razor wire over industrial buildings and things like that um so it's just a visual presence at the moment and i think the essay is going to um definitely have sort of more diary that will you know kind of connect to to very much the absolute now of uh um the you know the sort of various sort of lockdowns that, that we're experiencing around the world um and i'm in, also interested in things that sort of are uh, sort of happening you know sort of under under that radar as well uh yeah so I'll, I'll i'll be thinking about some of that um uh, and then i think there'll be um some film as well so you saw some still still photographs here and um i love the form of the photo essay um and i think we'll also be looking at um making a short film um that will connect to the essay and it's um in its themes and its strands um and i i have a sense that that may be um may incorporate animation as well so um we'll definitely have i mean 
um, we'll definitely have some moving move, moving images as well um, so that's that's kind of the the sort of shape and movement um, as I as I see it um, developing yeah exciting so exciting 